Hi everyone, I have just come in from the garden where I've picked two beautiful heads of cabbage. So these two heads of cabbage, the variety name is Cor de Boo, and you can see it's kind of like a teardrop shaped cabbage and they look really nice. So today I'm going to be making some sauerkraut to preserve them. And sauerkraut is a really great way to preserve cabbage and it's also really good for you. It's a fermented food so it has a lot of probiotics and I think it's one of the easiest beginner fermentation projects you can do. It's super easy, all you need is cabbage and salt. So yeah, that's gonna be the project for today. First thing I have to do is wash up this cabbage and then we're going to start thinly slicing it. like frozen ice inside of here. That's just solid ice that was inside the cabinet. I'm cutting the cores out of each wedge of cabbage and then I'm going to be slicing all of this by hand since I don't really have a huge quantity of cabbage. You can always use a mandolin if you want to and that might help you to get really thin slices if you are not comfortable with your knife skills. And as you can see, I'm using green cabbage today, but you can definitely use red cabbage if you would like. When you make sauerkraut out of red cabbage, it does end up a really beautiful color. I haven't had good success growing red cabbage, so none of mine this year produced any heads. I think next year I'm gonna have to try some new varieties of red cabbage to see if I can get any of them to produce a really nice head. But this variety of cabbage for me has done really well and I've been able to get some nice heads out of them. You can also experiment with adding some other vegetables to your sauerkraut, maybe some onions or carrots or some garlic for some flavoring. You can also add beets and that will add a really nice red color that will color your entire batch of sauerkraut. In the past, we've also made like a golden sauerkraut, adding some turmeric to the jar. So you can definitely experiment with it. Maybe just include like 25% of your total cabbage in the form of other vegetables if you're going to do that. For today's sauerkraut, I'm gonna be keeping it really simple. It's just going to be a plain sauerkraut with just salt and I'm not adding any other vegetables or flavorings because I think that plain is just the way that I like it best, but feel free to get creative with it. So I have finished prepping the cabbage. It's all nice and thinly sliced and it looks like a pretty big bowl right now, but by the time we're done with this, it's going to shrink down significantly. My guess is that we'll probably end up with two quarts, maybe under. Um, so throughout the whole process, we're gonna kind of like smash everything down and it's gonna release a lot of its own liquid. So now all we have to do is add salt to this. I have about four pounds of cabbage here and basically the formula is whatever weight of cabbage cabbage you have, you take two to four percent of that and that's how much salt you add. So I have about four pounds of cabbage here and I'm going to use like a tablespoon and a half of salt. So I'm going to add that in right now and let that sit for a little bit because as the salt sits with the cabbage it's going to help draw out some of the moisture and this is going to shrink down and then later on we're going to go in and kind of like massage everything and get the cabbage really nice and soft and as you massage it it will release more of its liquid as well but for now i'm just going to add in the salt and let it sit for a little bit that way this will kind of shrink down it'll make it easier for me to work with and then i can go in later and massage the cabbage so I've got one tablespoon and then another half. As you can see, it's like kind of hard to mix it in the beginning when there's so much volume. 
but if I just let this sit for a little bit, it will shrink down and then I can get in there and like really like squeeze the cabbage in between my fingers and like really massage it. And that will help like make it softer. Um, so we'll do more of that later on. But for right now, I'm gonna set this aside and just let it sit in that salt. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting for that cabbage to sit for a little bit, I'm gonna get to work preserving some of these apples. We went apple picking the other day at a local orchard and we picked a bag of like apples fresh from the trees, but then we also got this half bushel of what they call scratch and dent apples. Sometimes they're called like seconds apples. And basically what they are is the apples that are not quite perfect. They might have some blemishes, but you're able to get them for a really affordable price. So we got these apples for 50% off what they would normally be. So this half bushel only cost us $15, which I think is a great deal because this is a lot of apples. There's probably over like 50 apples in here. So it's a great deal. And most of these apples actually are in pretty good condition. They might have like a few dents and a few little blemishes, but for the most part, like I wouldn't even be upset if I bought these at a grocery store. They're still like in nearly perfect condition. But even the ones that are a little bit dented, it really doesn't matter for some uses. So for a lot of these apples, I wanna make applesauce and for applesauce, it really doesn't matter if there are some blemishes that you can just cut out. It's all going to be cooked down. But today what I'm going to be doing is dehydrating a lot of these apples. I just like, I'm not really in the mood to can right now. So dehydrating is gonna be a really quick and easy way to get some of these put away. We really like to have dehydrated apples just as a snack. So honestly, with whatever I dehydrate, we'll probably go through them really quickly, but it is a really nice thing to have in our pantry for when we're hungry and we don't really feel like preparing anything. We can just grab some dehydrated apples and then it's a pretty healthy snack. But if you preserve a lot of them, you can probably also use them for like baking and cooking. I bet they would be really good rehydrated in some oatmeal. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do today. We have a whole mix of different apples here, so I don't really know what variety is what, but I don't really care. I think they're all gonna be good as dehydrated apples. When you dehydrate things, since you're taking out all the moisture, a lot of the flavor and the sugars are really concentrated. So even if we have like a more tart apple, I think it tastes really good as a dehydrated apple. So I'm gonna choose some of these to pull out. We'll see how many I can fit on my dehydrator trays and I'll show you how I do that whole process. So I guess we'll start with this. I'll see how much of this I can fit on my trays and we'll take it from there. To dehydrate the apples, I'm going to peel each of them and then slice them about a third of an inch thick. I like to take the peels off because they can get really leathery if you leave them on when you dehydrate them. And I do also like to keep them a little bit on the thicker side because I think that the texture is a little bit better after dehydrating. Keep in mind that these will shrink as they dehydrate. So whatever thickness you're starting out with, you'll end up with maybe half of that in the end. We find that we like the thicker wedges because they're chewier at the end instead of being like really dry and brittle, but it's totally up to personal preference. If you want them to be more chip-like, you can always slice them a little bit more thinly and then they'll be a little bit crispier and then I'm just gonna stick them straight onto my dehydrator trays. I used to treat them with like lemon juice or citric acid to prevent any browning, but I just don't really find it that necessary because I think even if you take those extra steps, it is still gonna get a little bit brown anyway. And that way when I skip the step, I don't have to introduce any extra liquid or moisture to the surface of the apples, and that helps them to dehydrate more quickly it saves me an extra step and then I don't have to use like paper towels or cloth towels to blot them dry. And again, you can use a mandolin for this step if you want to, and that will help you to get really even slices, but I chose to just do this by hand. This year, we upgraded to an Excalibur dehydrator. We were able to find one secondhand off of Facebook Marketplace, and it has been such an improvement and has really helped me to dehydrate more food this year and it dehydrates really evenly and efficiently so i really love this thing and it fits so much food in there definitely a great thing to have if you want to get into dehydration and food preservation
So I'm taking a break from the apples for now. I already peeled and sliced the entire bowl that I set aside and I only filled like four out of my nine dehydrator trays. So I'm pretty impressed with how many apples I think I'll be able to fit. So I filled up another bowl and I think I'm gonna be able to get through all of these to fit those in the dehydrator, but I'll do those later. For now, we can turn back to the sauerkraut. You can see it's kind of shrunk down in volume a little bit um, since I added the salt. So now we're gonna go in and do like the massaging part of it. Aaron decided to come help me with this part because he thought it would be really fun to do this like massaging and squeezing part. And as you can see, you're just gonna be really rough with this cabbage and go at it. You can squeeze it and massage it and this will help to soften up the cabbage. It will release a lot of its liquid and it's also going to start to shrink down. So you can actually go straight to this massaging step directly after spreading the salt on it. You don't have to wait like I did. I just decided to do it because it can be a little bit hard to manage like volume wise if it's like overflowing out of your bowl, but you can definitely skip that step if you don't want to wait. You can see how very quickly this cabbage broke down. I think it's because I did let it sit in that salt for a little bit. It did help to kind of like tenderize the cabbage even before we went in to start massaging and squeezing it. And we didn't add any water to this at all, but you can see that the bowl is very filled with liquid. That's all liquid from the cabbage itself. After a while, I think Aaron was starting to regret his decision of helping with this process. If you don't know, cabbage is a little bit notorious for the smell and doing this process will get just a little bit stinky. I think you're good now though. Well, the smell is interesting. Of cabbage? It smells like old people. Yeah, that's what cabbage smells like. It's crazy. Get oh my gosh. Smelling. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Forgot. It smells interesting. It smells like old people. It really does smell like old people though. Didn't you know this? Uh, you don't know the cabbage smells like that? I don't know. I don't remember that. Then we're gonna start putting our sauerkraut into some mason jars to go through the fermentation process. We're using quart-sized mason jars here, but really any size vessel you wanna use will work. And you can also use like a nice stone crock. I just would stay away from metal or plastic. So we're gonna really pack the kraut into the jars using a wooden pin to kind of like tamp everything down and make sure it's really nice and packed in there. Tamping it down will also help to push some of the liquid up as well. You might be able to get it completely covered with its own liquid just by pressing it down, but if not, you can always add some extra liquid. And if your cabbage mixture is looking especially dry, you can always just make like a separate 2% brine to make sure that you cover the cabbage completely. Just a little note here that you might want to leave some extra headspace. You can see that I didn't really do that here and I was definitely aware that this would bubble over as it would ferment and I did know that this would happen so I put this in a tray where any of that excess liquid that spilled over would be caught but you might just want to avoid that entire hassle and just leave like an inch of headspace because this will expand as it goes through the fermentation process. So we are all done with our sauerkraut now. Like I guessed earlier, we filled up two quarts. And what I did was I just put something to weigh down the cabbage inside and it also helps to keep the liquid level above the actual cabbage. You don't wanna have any cabbage floating on top cause that can mold. So as long as it's submerged, you should be good. If you have like a special fermentation weight, that works great. I don't have that. So I just use like a little measuring cup or shot glass. And then for the lid, I just put it on very loosely 
not all the way. I leave a few of the threads unscrewed. Um, that way there is space for any gases that form to escape. Otherwise, if you tighten it too much, you will have to go in every day or twice a day and kind of burp it, which is when you just like loosen the cap a little bit and let those gases come out. And as it ferments, it'll get a little bit bubbly. It might overflow, so I put both of my jars into this little container that has a lip in case any of it overflows out of the jar. It'll catch into this container rather than like all over the counter. So after we fill our two jars, basically you just have to wait. These are going to stay on the counter at room temperature and the amount of time can vary based on like temperature in your house. So I think we usually go for about two weeks when we do sauerkraut, but after a few days to a week, We'll probably just taste it every so often and see if it's like the level of sourness we like. But once you have it at the level that you like, you can just screw the lid on completely and stick it in your fridge and it will last pretty much indefinitely. In the past, we've had our sauerkraut last one to two years. I think this year we had just finished our sauerkraut that we made in 2020. So once it goes through that fermentation process, it preserves it basically indefinitely. So that's really great to just have it like stored away in the fridge. So yeah, I'm gonna set this aside on the counter. It'll be done in a few weeks and that's all there is to it.